Um, I actually met Tom many, many years ago. Uh, I always joke that I'm probably one of his oldest friends. He's probably one of mine. But uh, I met Tom uh, when I first went to Kansas City. Uh, they put me up in a hotel. I ended up, from day one, I felt like progressively more awful. And it finally got to the point where I was like, man, something's wrong with me. So of course I went to PubMed, like every intelligent person did. And I started putting my symptoms into PubMed. And it came back that I had leukemia. <laughs> so uh, I was like, man, there's no way. Um, so I call a good friend of mine, um, a guy named Bob Sapp. He's a professional fighter. He was in like the uh, longest yard. He's like a big foreign pound black guy who fights in Japan named uh, The Beast. And I call Bob and I'm like, ah, I got leukemia. He's like, bro, you ain't got leukemia. But I know this doctor. We've got a contact. He, uh, he's really good. He's probably the best I've ever seen in the world in solving unsolvable problems. And I was like, I like a guy who can solve unsolvable problems of men. So he gives me his contact information. I call him. Uh, I happen to be in Los Angeles where I'm from at my parents. And he's like, hey, why don't you come meet me? I'm at the Comedy and Magic Club on Sunset. And I'm like, it's 8 o'clock at night. He's like, is that a problem? I guess not. So I get in the car and I drive from Palos Verdes to uh, uh, Sunset Hollywood. And uh, this guy walks out of the Comedy and Magic Club with a drink. And we had our console in the parking lot. So, you know, that's how all the high level NFL stuff usually works. It usually involves a parking lot at the Comic Magic Club. And uh, he, uh, we had the console. He goes, No problem, come to my place, uh, my clinic in Arizona, and we'll get rocking. So, I go home. A few days later, I drive out to Arizona, and clinic, I mean, his house. Uh, he kitchen. took his kitchen. I walk in, he, he literally took 40 bottles of blood from me in his kitchen. Uh, I'm like laying on the, on like uh, sitting there, and I'm like getting lightheaded from all the blood that this vampire is stealing from me. And he's like, "Hey, you want a protein shake?" I'm like, "I need something." And uh, he did a comprehensive medical history on me, and he basically gave me an encyclopedia on. Uh, I mean, ran every single test known to man, and came back that I was uh, toxic levels of the 13 types of mold that he tested me for. I was toxic levels of like everyone, and it shut down systems in my body. So he put me on like a antiviral, antifungal, you know, IVs a whole deal. Within like days, I was better. So I went back to Kansas City, and uh, the hotel they had me staying at, they had actually shut down because somebody working there had got Legionnaire's disease. So uh, they had a terrible bone infestation. Thank you, Kansas City Chiefs, for uh, putting me up there for three months. Almost killed me. So uh, thank God I met Tom. He, he saved me. And at that point, Tom's been really my avenging angel for injuries. Um, you know, any type of uh, injury that I had every off season, he always did my blood work uh, to the point where uh, I wasn't comfortable dealing with doctors. I wanted a research scientist. I wanted somebody that was actively doing research in a clinic that was looking to try to ramp up human performance uh, to the highest level. And he's worked with just about every professional athlete you've ever heard of and many people that you have. And um, it's just been not only a family friend for me and my kids and my wife and my dad and my brothers. I mean, my whole family goes and sees him. And, um, you know, and I count as one of my closest friends. So, uh, really excited. He's been, we've done a talk to me, Johnny, on the long road. He spoke at the symposium, and it really wouldn't be an event without him. So, uh, without further ado, Dr. Tommy Kluwer. Thanks, man. Thanks, uh, and who are you staying at? So, uh, first, I'd like to say it's uh, always exciting uh, for me to come to these events because being around so many uh, cool people, it's like a battery recharge for me. Uh, just talking to new faces last night and seeing old friends, it's like I get all this extra energy that I siphon off everyone around me. So I want to thank everyone for recharging my battery. And uh, gosh, where do you go? Like in the last year, we've uh, grown exponentially. We can do things today that we have never been capable of doing uh, ever before in history. So it's like, where do you start? Where do you begin when you can measure uh, you know, 22,000 genes in someone? We can actually isolate a single cancer cell in the human body and then determine how each cancer cell in your body is different. Or when we're doing an assessment on someone, uh, just out in the hall, we're talking about difference between stability and strength. Uh, lots of guys will come in and they'll tell me, oh, I need to get stronger, but they can't stabilize around a joint angle in their body and they confuse a lack of stability with lack of, with lack of strength and they're two very different things controlled by different regions of the brain. So I don't really know, um, I had in my mind prepared like this incredible PowerPoint presentation with all these formal things, and that could always be a little boring and dry. 
and then Luke informed me that we were going to just be talking. I'm like, well, the idea is that you can, you really can't can, uh, stop that for time. He's got to hope to contain him. And we were hoping to change the venue a little bit so that we could contain him. And I've seen his PowerPoints, and they are one of a research scientist. Trust me, you're welcome. Yeah, it's, it's it, yeah. So we wanted to kind of give it like a real, uh, like a free flow uh, kind of deal. But um, in terms of, uh, you know, we had, you know. Uh, Dr. Mike come up and he's talking about you know how to uh, assess people and get people healthy and um, I didn't even tell you the story how I met him I actually found him on Instagram uh, Dr. Mike and uh, I watched his Instagram video and I was like I gotta go meet this dude and I drove down to San Diego and met him and we've been friends ever since and uh, you know you guys got to see a little bit of the genius so uh, I think I'm pretty fairly adept at assessing with but uh, the one thing that Tom I think knows more than any other human being on the planet is how to not only uh, fix injuries on terms of like a cellular level, especially cartilage. I've never met anybody in my life that knows more about cartilage than Tom. I remember when I tore cartilage, I called him up and said, hey, uh, I got this torn cartilage, I got some arthritis, and he's like, okay, uh, uh, let me pull some studies and I'll give you some feedback. I was like, okay. And then I didn't hear from him for like two or three weeks. And I finally called him back, I'm like, are you gonna fucking call me back? He's like, dude, I downloaded 10,000 studies. You know how long it takes me to pour over that stuff? <laughs> and I was like, Two or three weeks. Just like, about. Oh. He's like, don't worry, I know everything now. Like, that's, that's Tom. Like, uh, and he, I mean, literally locked himself in and like figure these things out. And uh, uh, you know, and then the hilarious part is, is um, in terms of like being a doctor and this, he actually has a, a cooler background as an athlete, which I'm going to make him tell you about about some of his accomplishments as an athlete. Uh, because those are by far the better stories. So, Tom, tell us a little bit about your athletic background and how you kind of got into this. Oh, goodness gracious. So, um, all right, so I'm working at Radio Shack, and uh, so about, this is so about 14, and uh, doing part-time stuff, I'm putting you know, boxes on shelves, and uh, this guy comes in and says, hey, um, I saw you training in the gym, you look pretty strong, have you thought about competing in powerlifting or powerlifting, what's that? So I didn't know anything about like squat, bench press, deadlift, and competition at that point. I just, uh, I had seen it and stuff, but I didn't really know anything about it. So imagine if you will, like I had the worst squat form ever, worst deadlift form, I looked like a, like a C when I'm deadlifting, uh, terrible bench mechanics. And so they get me ready and I go into my con first contest and I win all the county records and I win everything for the adult, uh, for the men in my weight class. So I was like, you're really strong, you can go really far. Of course, what they did tell me is, you don't know what you're doing, and you can get hurt eventually. Uh, so anyway, I stuck with it, and then I started meeting guys that were in Olympic lifting, and uh, I was able to get to the nationals in powerlifting. I did not take any drugs at that point, uh, not because I didn't want to, simply because I didn't know they existed. I was too young. And then uh, as time went on, I got into strongman competitions, and I started training with Magnus from Magnus, and I built Kazmaier and Magnus Samuelson. Like all the guys you might see on like ESPN2 when they're doing some of the syndicated programs. And uh, I've got some really good stories with Magnus from Magnus and where we would be doing a seminar together. And Magnus was about 100 pounds heavier than me and just a few inches taller. And so people would ask a question, they would look at Magnus and he would know what to say to go like this, which means that I had to answer the question. So even though I had like a bachelor's degree at the time, the nickname became the doctor. Because I could answer all these questions from these guys all over the world. And even though I was not a doctor, even though I didn't have any type of master's degree or PhD or anything, I had not been in medical school at that point. That's how this kind of stuff uh, stuck with me. But in one particular uh, story, it's called the, uh, the Bird Chip Curse. And, uh, when I was writing for T Nation or Testosterone Online, I actually did uh, a series of uh, articles called The Gang of Five, and I would write as five different personalities. So imagine it's just one writer. But I would pretend I'm a coach, I'm an athlete, I'm a scientist, etc. And the idea was like I'm fighting with myself inside my head, and I'm right from the perspective of each individual. In the Birch and Kerr story, um, I, I talk about how Magnus's motivational techniques with me when we were training. So I'm pulling this tire, a tire only weighs about 300 pounds, but it's very um, thin and has a lot of uh, surface area. So it has a pretty high coefficient of friction. I'm pulling it through the grass. I'm kind of a shorter guy, so to keep the chain length was so long, I couldn't get any real leverage on this thing. So imagine, if you will, leaning all the way back, and I only weighed about 220 at the time, and it had absolutely no impact on this tire. He was barely moving. And Magnus comes up behind me and goes, pull, pull, it doesn't move. Pull, it doesn't move. I will shove it up your ass. And all of a sudden, it starts moving. So, 
that's how it uh, was kind of like led to all these other events. So uh, Magnus did have some very unique motivational strategies, and uh, they tend to work with me. I was always one of those guys that uh, it worked with negative reinforcement. I was never the guy who said, "Good job, try harder." Like, what kind of wimpy shit is that? Like, that's never resonated with me. Uh, my buddies would be like, "I'll kick your ass," and then I would do better. And so uh, I hope that I don't employ those same negative motivational techniques with others, because I know that everybody responds that way. But it didn't work really well with me. So then you get into uh, strongman, and I think you set what world records in the law. Yeah. So when uh, so imagine if you will. Uh, the, sorry, for first event I do the log, it starts at 250 pounds. At the time, I had never done more than 220 pounds. So I'm going into this event knowing I can't even make the warm up weight. Okay? So, as you might imagine, I did not have the confidence that one might would have when they're going into a competition. And uh, I wound up connecting with a shot putter from uh, Boston. I'm drawing a blank the guy's name now. And he, he got me, he taught me how to do um, reverse band training. So, imagine they have like these nine foot or ten foot racks. They have these posts and the bands are from the top coming down to the lock. So imagine I have like 180 pounds of, you know, that I'm standing up with, and when you lock it out, it's like 300 pounds. So it was a really cool strategy to work on your technique and get used to handling these loads. And um, it just worked really well for me. So uh, I went from, I couldn't do 220, next thing I'm doing 250 for a double. Next thing I was locking out over 300 pounds, I eventually locked out 400, about 200 kilos in a log. And um, that's a brutally heavy log, by the way, just to get it in position and roll it up your body. Uh, it, the mechanics are not real healthy, especially for a guy who weighs 220 pounds. Uh, but it, it really helped a lot. And I was able to set a national record in the log press. So you get in a uh, strong man, and obviously your technique is not ideal. You're probably maybe not uh, structurally set up, and you end up hurting yourself. I hurt myself a lot. You hurt yourself a lot. So that's kind of what started you on the road in terms of uh, just kind of like personal, like I need to fix these things? Yeah, so the joke I always have with everyone is, hey, everything wrong with me, I did to myself. And I have this kind of mindset, if I created the problem, I could solve the problem. So I don't look at it like, you know, whatever would ever happen. I looked at it right. I didn't allow for my position in my hips. I didn't allow for the position in my feet. I didn't realize that I, I walked with a wobble. These are things that neurologically, felt normal to me, even though it wasn't normal, but I wasn't aware of a lot of these, um, the challenges that we have inside of us. And so today it led to, we're really big into uh, teaching people internal body awareness. Um, you know, where, where things are going in terms of the future of exercise science, we tend to think I lift weights, you know, uh, progressive resistance or progressive distance is some form of overload, and that's why I get stronger and stronger. But what is missed in that process is that the difference, when you're 80 or, or older, the difference between someone that's frail and someone that's not frail is a nervous system, you know, basically controlling the rest of the body. So the real secret is understanding how to get your brain connected or mapped to every joint, every muscle in the body. It's easier said than done because how do you teach someone to feel something they've never felt before? So it's not something so easy. Um, you got to do some really hokey drills, they're sometimes boring, and it don't mean to make sense at first, but once people make the internal connection, then they, they see the results right away. So as an example, we'll do um, single-sided training for athletes or athletic-type people, and they'll be like, how is this going to affect my bench press? And like, just see how your body responds. And three weeks later, when they go back into doing like a barbell bench press, and they uh, lift significantly more weight or the same weight for more reps. They're like, how did you know? I didn't know. What I do know is that if there's a weak link in the system and you address the weak link, the whole system gets better. And so it, it, it opens up our minds now. So I'm going to say something that's going to sound at first like really crazy, but we can, si no. <laughs> we can simultaneously increase flexibility, mobility, strength, muscle endurance, cardiovascular endurance at the same time. That's very different than if you looked at some of the periodization models where you have your phase of training. You know, you don't normally think that way, but... So what, like a block periodization plus one, like a concurrent model, where you can kind of develop things with a cohesion? Well, you could develop everything at once, and, and the, the secret is understanding how the brain controls everything. So imagine you're starting any type of training program, but you're um, right cortex 
and your left cerebellum are not communicating as well as a left cortex, right cerebellum. So it's kind of like having a short in the internal circuitry of your nervous system. And so no matter what you do, you can get better, but you always have that weak link inside of you that you can't see, touch, or feel. And now all of a sudden, once you correct that weak link, everything you do becomes easier, so relatively you make all this improvement in everything else. And it's really hard for uh, people to conceptually get this, because remember, you can't see, touch, or feel it uh, without a lot of practice. But I think this is kind of like the overlap. Like, I'm sure everybody's seen stories and knows people, like some, um, typically it's like a martial artist who doesn't really work out with weights per se, maybe on the thinner side, but they have crazy strength. Maybe even like a Tai Chi or yoga type person, like, how's this person so strong, given the fact they don't have huge muscles or lifting, you know, big weights in the gym, and the allowance is that they've somehow learned how to control the muscles or, or the force producing uh, systems of their body. And I mean, I guess this is kind of a preview to the way Dr. Tom thinks, and this is gonna go into training, into medical, into every, every vein of where he's dabbling in is, you know, the term you used in, a, we were chatting months ago, is disruption. So disruption, sometimes, mostly with technology in the medical field, but when it comes to traditional thinking, strength and conditioning, anything like that, He's the guy who's ready to think differently because he has, I think, truly the power of five brains in that head, and that's why he's able to. Well, he's actually that. schizophrenic. That's a lot of. Is that what it is? He's a brain? Okay. Well, you know, he's had all those five personality types, so they're actually legitimate people. So it's like a beautiful mind, like Russell Crowe. So no, you have a panel of five doctors behind you that we can't see? Well, it's probably just different voices. Uh, you know. <laughs> what I actually appreciated was, uh, you know, like the nonlinear thinking, like, you know, everybody when you, you know, like, for example, uh, uh, you know, my knee's messed up or I have some issue, you go to the doctor and he's like, uh, let's do surgery, right? Like, that's his only, that's what he can do. He can either give you a pill to kind of block the pain or he can do a surgery, which he thinks to fix it or cut it out, put it in knee replacement. What I appreciated about Tom was... Um, there has to be something else. There has to be a different way than just A and B, and just going off of the medicine and the uh, information that's you know 50 years ago, where they just want to replace parts doesn't make sense. There should be a, a mechanism like we talked about, like cartilage regrowth, in terms of like just developing stability within a joint and why you know osteophytes. And it really just took him down this idea, which is you know, uh, and I think even. You know, talk about human performance from every deal from uh, you know not only lifting weights but then like you know measuring uh, every marker in the blood to try to figure out what the optimal dose is to try to create this not just you know are you within the healthy range but how do you optimally do this and as a professional football player uh, going in and getting my blood work I mean it's uh, it, it, you know for me I never trusted the team so I know I know you guys are gonna uh, not be surprised because uh, somebody has a vested interest, not necessarily in me, just my performance, and I was more interested in my health and performance. So going to Tom and saying, okay, hey, uh, I want you to give me a full blood panel. I want you to talk to me about how do I optimize this stuff? Like how do I, if I'm low in something, if I'm low in zinc, magnesium, and iron because I have some low level inflammation and nothing will attach within the uh, receptors of the gut, then I need to fix that low level inflammation, so let's find it. And you know, food panels and this, I mean, we did extensive work to try to figure out this stuff so you can play at the highest level. And uh, for for Tom, especially in the training piece, there was never something where I don't do that. Like, okay, we're gonna look at blood work, we're gonna look at the training, we're gonna look at this. I mean, and he's also the first person where if he doesn't know, he will tell you, be like, I don't know, but let's go find the guy. Um, you know, like Craig Bueller, for example, when I was having some issues, he's like, I know this guy in Caseville, Utah, we're gonna go to see Dr. Bueller, and we flew out, and three days later, uh, you, know, uh, you know, worked with Craig, and, ended up fixing what was wrong. So uh, the idea that there is a solution for everything, and his next big fight right now is cancer. Um, you know, we've uh, talked extensively that the model for cancer is not one that's, uh, we're getting our ass kicked, so they have to change the model, and just the definition of insanity, doing the same thing over and over again, expecting a different response, isn't working. But, uh, you know, we do that in everything. We figure, hey, uh, you know, if you know I have knee pain, you can either give me a pill or you can cut the knee out and give you an artificial one. I mean, to me, that those aren't the two options I want. And, um, you know, for power athlete, battle the bullshit, and uh, really the theme of the company of unlocking athletic potential, I look at it in terms of just not one thing, but just everything. And, uh, you know, Tom has been a great lifeline for that. So, um, I, you know, and I, maybe we could open up to some questions, but I mean, in terms of like blood testing injuries, really just anything, I don't know if there's uh, really anything that you can't tackle or we just haven't tackled over the course of, you know, two decades. Any questions? <coughs> Come on, Andrew. And 
Tom, maybe you could talk a little about med school and you know, where what path that would be on. Sure. Okay. So should we take the question? Yeah, so the question takes us first. Okay. Push the button. Don't worry, you don't need it. Just, just yeah, up. push the button. So I'm curious about cartilage um, for growth, maybe even relating to maybe the knee, for example. Say the person restores proper alignment to the knee. What have you found uh, in terms of biochemistry or, or even supplement wise that helps um, speed up the process of recovery? That's a good question. So uh, in 2011, at the American College of Sports Medicine annual meeting, um, data was presented that shows that using a, um, a polynutrient formulation, you can accelerate tissue repair post-surgery up to eight times. Um, the significance of this is that this was a um, uh, conference for orthopedic surgeons. So um, you would expect orthopedic surgeons attending the conference would learn this information. Um, from that point to now, I have uh, lectured at Mayo Clinic and Cleveland Clinic at with different orthopedic groups. Uh, zero doctors are aware of that data. So essentially, they do the surgery and they throw you out to life and they expect somehow naturally to heal. Um, that's a foolish venture. Doesn't, there's nothing, if you don't take any action, right? if you don't do anything, nothing heals faster. Uh, essentially, what the, uh, the cocktails involve is uh, vitamins and minerals, uh, certain amino acids like proline and lysine, hydroxyproline, and then uh, sort of like uh, cartilage precursors like. Uh, glucosamine sulfate, N acetyl D glucosamine, chondroid sulfate, um, and even things like uh, hyaluronic acid and then essential amino acids. So you can almost say it's like giving everybody the kitchen sink, right? You got all this stuff. And the rationale behind it is that on an individual basis, I can't tell you, like, if you're low in proline and you're low in vitamin C and you're low in lysine. So from a systems perspective, if I simply give everyone you know, all these precursors or nutrients at one time, uh, what you do see is that the, the tissue pair accelerates eight times faster, and it works at any age of the lifespan. So if you're 30, 50, 70, if you're 100, it still works. So it shows you that um, even at the end of the lifespan, we still have the capability of synthesizing uh, new tissue um, what I would say is this, though, um, the way orthopedic surgeons interpret MRI data is basically wrong. They look at an MRI and they say statements like, there is no more cartilage in the joint where you're born and bone. The problem with that statement is that an MRI does not get down to zero's chondrocytes. So you have a technology that can't see all the way to zero. And I was taught this by a physician from Spain that retired. And I told him one day, oh, I'm born on bone. He goes, how do you know? I go, I have an MRI. He goes, that's useless. I'm like, what do you mean it's useless? That's, that's what every doctor uses. He goes, you have to think for yourself. Don't copy what everybody else is doing. And this guy was like, you know, older, gruff type dude. And I'm like, well, how do you know then that you know, the MRI is wrong? He goes, because we did over 10,000, or I think it was some weird number, like 10,000, 500,000, but a huge number of people, they actually went into their joint and did cartilage biopsies and then compare the data from the biopsy under an electron microscope, which can go down to a cellular level with the MRI data. And what they found is all these guys who were quote unquote bone on bone still had viral chondrocytes. What's also interesting is the chondrocytes show up black on the MRI. So in appearance, it doesn't appear that they're actually there. And um, what we know now is there's some really clever technologies we're starting to use. One is irrespective of the disease process. If you have cancer, arthritis, um, diabetes, uh, heart disease, there's a linear relationship where as a disease becomes more severe, the uh, intracellular water or the hydration of the cell goes down. So the people with the greatest disease have the smallest cells by lack of water inside the cell. So one really cool uh, technology we're looking at right now is if I simply get more water inside your cell, can that reverse the disease process? And it actually appears by getting water in a cell that the water expands like air balloon and it tugs on cytoskeletal proteins that induce a process called mechanotransduction. So basically think of these wires that are in a cell called cytoskeletal proteins. They affect genes and those genes help the cell become more healthy. And so it, it's really, I mean, think about this. We're really talking about basic stuff. You see him laughing, which is always so funny. It's like, you guys get it, right? <laughs> <laughs> I, I, like, I, I just, 
kind of laugh, but I'm like, if he's this excited about it, I gotta be excited. Yeah. So then I write it down, I like, research it, and then I get excited. Well, it's just like, I mean, think about it. Like, we got all these drugs and all these different things that are being done that are expensive and have side effects, and maybe people have insurance so they can't afford it. And it was gonna come back to, like, we're gonna give you more water. And <laughs> somehow you're gonna get healthier. It's kind of comical, I think. Um, but the, so, what I was um, getting at is, um, uh, we have the ability to remodel tissue, um, and uh, part of that remodeling involves getting a healthy movement pathway. It's very challenging to do that. Like, you need a competent therapist or professional to evaluate your gait. And then, when we're looking at people, remember, we're looking at them from the outside, and we're trying to interpret what's happening with them on the inside. And so, uh, in the case of someone like myself, where I have no medial meniscus in either knee, I have uh, allegedly bone on bone in both hips, uh, bone on bone in my right elbow, bone on bone in my left shoulder. So, on paper, I would not be the client you want because there's incredible amounts of damage. And uh, even though I've been told I wouldn't walk again and all these other silly things, I can walk now, but my gait mechanically no matter what I do with my brain, right, I'm missing pieces, like I'm missing a meniscus. So there's always going to be a certain vector that's happening in my knee. And while I can try really hard to do certain things, I'm never going to walk as healthy as someone that has both the misguy and their joint, because it's like I'm missing a leg on, right? I'm missing a leg on each knee. So we can do things to help the motor pathway, but we can't do certain things when there's no tissue there at all. And if I were to regenerate a meniscus, let's assume that was possible, um, that would take a very long time. And then would that meet with my sense of urgency and instant gratification, like I want results yesterday, like I'm sure some of you do. So that's where surgery could be potentially a good fit. Um, so I hope that answered your question. I didn't go off on too many tangents. Sure. Just a little follow-up. Where would, is this intravenous, intervascular, oral, and where do you purchase this cocktail? So there's a parking lot outside. Yeah. <laughs> there's a parking lot at the Comedy Magic Club. Yeah, or we'll do it outside here. Yeah. But, I've been uh, to LA before. Well, but uh, what Tom's really good on is uh, you know being able to test these things because uh, I remember you know us having a conversation about supplements and those of you guys that have heard me talk on nutrition. Uh, how do most people get their supplement advice? Bro, I started taking the supplement and I feel amazing. <laughs> and then you're like, well, I want to feel amazing. I'm a bro, let me take this supplement. <laughs> And then we take the supplement, and next thing you know, you walk in, and um, uh, like you walk in, and like all your whole counter space covered in uh, you know nothing but half used supplements. Which is funny because I still picture walking into Doctor Tom's house, and there was nowhere to sit, there was nowhere to put a drink down because there was so many supplements. <laughs> there was literally hundreds of bottles, and I thought, dude, this guy's this is crazy. This is like GNC, but like, <laughs> and then I realized that these companies were sending Tom all this stuff for to try out and like you know have his evaluation. So I was like, they, you got all this stuff for free? He's like, yeah, a lot of it's crap, but I might throw it away. He's like, I don't know, it might not be crap in the future, so I don't want to throw it away, I might miss it. Uh, but you know, him coming in, I asked him, well, like, what supplement should I take? How should I do this? And he's like, well, I don't really know because I haven't done the blood work on you, so I don't know you're deficient. You know, your guy might be taking copper. He's low on copper, he feels great. You might be fine on copper. You take copper, don't know us anything, but you might be low on selenium, you might be low on this. You might be, uh, you know, uh, you know, have some other issues. I mean, the, the big one was, I remember I got my blood work done and he called me and he goes, you eat a high protein diet, don't you? I was like, yeah, what do you mean? Like, I felt like he was going, you know, what's coming next? And he goes, man, I, um, I would have thought for somebody that ate a high protein diet, the protein content of your blood might be higher. And I've told this story to nutrition where we go through digestion starts in the mouth and how it starts, which comes from Tom, you know, spoon feeding me like a young child and being like, well, let's talk about digestion. If you don't chew your food or you don't chew your meat, there's enzymes in the saliva that effectively mix up and digest proteins, carbs, and fats. And if, you know, especially meat, like use these white things you have in your mouth to rip the flesh and start basically breaking it down. Because if you eat like a dog, you rip and swallow, which how many of you guys in here do that? Guilty, <laughs> everybody. Then you're not giving your body an effective chance for digestion. And I can see that the, uh, you know, epic grass-fed steak that you've been overpaying for um, isn't doing shit for you. And I was like, <gasps> you know, like, he just, you know, like, kicked my dog or something. I was like, so insulted. But then the next time I got my blood work done, he's like, wow, it, uh, it went up dramatically. What change did you make? And I told him, and he's like, wow, you made a life change. Do you know how hard it is for people to make life changes? 
He said people rather just take a pill. I mean, you could, you know, type 2 diabetes, for example, uh, disease of carbohydrates. If you eat a low-carb diet, exercise, uh, you know, uh, non meat glucose uptake type stuff, you could manage type 2 diabetes. But what do they do? They just say, hey, you can still have your chocolate cake, just take this stuff. And I think the one thing which I appreciated about Tom was saying, hey, like, here's the information, here's the change you want to make. And I know for just getting blood work done in terms of the supplementation, what Mike is asking for is figuring out where you're low and efficient and not just shotgun approaching, even though he does that, uh, but just being able to be more strategic in how you approach not only your nutrition and your supplementation. I mean, the training stuff has always been, uh, for me, um, super interesting, but the thing that I really uh, just so value is knowing what's going on inside my body, because we really don't. The only time we figure out what's going on inside of our body is usually when things go wrong. Like I feel awful or this, and then we don't have a healthy baseline. And um, you know, I saw Tom when I was sick. I mean, you know, I, I went to these doctors for the, the chiefs for, for months telling them that something was wrong with me, and they were like, well, we don't know. You could have leukemia, you could be a hypochondriac. We don't know what's going on. And then all of a sudden I come back and I'm like, uh, I've had toxic mold. Uh, of every type that they tested before to the point of like could kill people and they were like, oh, wow, that's really interesting. Okay, next. Like, uh, like that stuff where if I wasn't proactive, that would have ended my career and potentially destroyed my health. So I think as an individual, um, you can't just take somebody's word for it. You can't just go to one doctor and say, well, the doctor said I was fine. No, like you have to be able to like bloodhound this thing out and search it out and find the world's best and uh, I had to do that and now I have a symposium where I get to bring up uh, my coolest friends and introduce them to you so you guys don't have to go out and you know but you still should uh, go out and hunt these people down and um, you know there has never been a point where with Tom where I've called him on anything and he's ever said you know uh, I don't want to get into that or I don't think this I mean pretty much anything I call you on you're like oh that's something awesome let's figure everything we can out about it and I know without a doubt he is going to figure everything out about it. And then the crazy part is I'll talk to him a week later and he's like, yeah, everything I knew last week's over. Uh, it's all new. And I'll be like, really? Seven days? <laughs> and uh, I always joke like, hey, consistency and whatever. Tom's the only person where I'm like, oh man, I'm so ramped up. Or then Luke goes out and sees him. He's like, Dr. Tom said he everything's changed and you know nothing anymore. <laughs> and it's like this kind of standing joke. But I think what that shows is how fast information is coming in. Like, think about just the, uh, you know, since the inception of the internet, like I think like, uh, you know, more books have been written since the inception of the internet over the last 17 years than in all recorded history. Um, you know, more information, I mean, his ability to get on and be like, oh, there's a guy in Israel here, here, you know, Thailand, be able to look around the world and see what the world's best experts are doing and then figuring out those niches and then kind of trying to bring them together, um, uh, to me is uh, beyond an invaluable resource. And, uh, but to answer your question, I think you have to know what's going on in your own body. And the only way you got to do that is, uh, you know, being able to get some blood work, but then also if you have matrix in place to know if your performance is going up and down. Like, what are your markers for? What are your markers for health? How are you feeling? And do you have those markers when you're completely healthy? And do you know what it's going to look like in the future? Because if you go get blood work and the only time you know it is when you're sick, then I think it's very, very, it's much more difficult to figure out how to optimize. So, but uh, winding back into Mike's question, specific to the joint recovery and regeneration, what's the deal with that? Injection? So, um, thank you for that, Luke. So, uh, that would be done orally. Um, as far as the cocktail, there isn't like a single company that makes all these ingredients in one product. But I guess what I'll introduce right now is um, we're working on a technology that I think will be commercialized by middle of next year, where um, we'll make intravenous delivery outdated. So, we actually will be able to deliver stuff, uh, let's say nutrients or drugs, to the cell a million times or more, more efficiently, so we can get uh, more material, bioactive material inside a cell than never before in history, so we could dramatically reduce the volume. So imagine if you're taking 100 pills a day, and we can get that delivered to your cells a million times more efficiently, how much smaller would that mass be? And then we would have that mass in a system that basically gets absorbed in every cell of the body, including crossing the blood-brain barrier, uh, including it'll penetrate biofilm around the infectious areas of the body. Uh, and um, the idea is to basically disrupt the uh, nutraceutical or dietary supplement industry because um, right now the average person pays more for the label than they do for the product they actually put in their body. So $30, a product that retails at $30, it's probably about a dollar you know, for the material inside, 
was about two bucks on the packaging, the label, and people, because of visual bias, they look for stuff that looks cool in the ads. And, um, you know, marketers for some of the companies are very clever. They know if they keep flashing something in front of you. First time you look at it, you ignore it. Second time you look at it, it starts to register. Third and fourth time, like, hey, this stuff looks pretty good. It just gradually, it's called a drip campaign, just keeps going and going, and eventually wind up buying it. And it has nothing to do with the efficacy of the product or anything. So uh, our goal is, um, I don't know if this would be a good time to lead into some other stuff. Um, at, uh, uh, I mean, we're at a point right there now. There could be no better time. <laughs> so, uh, right, so I'll share with you that um, our goal is to eventually treat cancer for free. Uh, we have about uh, 200 uh, children that have some of the rarest cancer in history, and that was where we decided we would start. So think of this conceptually. Most centers want like the stage one and two cancers because they're easy to help those people. Nobody wants to tackle the advanced stage four cancers because in theory there's nothing that could be done. So uh, we started with one of the rarest cancers in history, which is a genetic fusion of CIC and UX4 genes. There's maybe 30 people in history that have had this cancer, and we've done really well. And so we've used that as a model to then extrapolate to unilex sarcoma. Uh, we created a nonprofit foundation. And uh, we create like a VIP experience for these families that cannot afford treatment for their children. So there's a guy there, his name was Jason, and earlier there was a woman, her name was Charlene. So there, um, gosh, uh, December of 2016, uh, they were on Facebook basically uh, sharing that their daughter had just went through all this chemotherapy regimen and radiation regimen. And after about two years or so of therapy, they were told by the hospital there was no response, and it's worse than ever, and nothing could be done. So they shared something on Facebook, and uh, one of the guys I went to school with is a doctor of physical therapy in, in New Jersey, and he knew Jason uh, better than I did. I knew him vaguely. And he just said, hey, go see this guy, Dr. Tom. And Jason's like, what the heck is this guy going to do that all these hospitals? What is the Dr. Tom? <laughs> uh, so, um, so the guy called me, and I talked with him and his wife, and he said, you know, how would you solve this problem? And I said, I don't know. There's no textbook that you could open and read the answers to. There's no classic take. But I understand biological measurement very well. I know if I measure enough variables, I'll be able to see the things that aren't obvious to other people, and then we'll be able to create a strategy. Uh, so their daughter is still alive today. Um, in her particular case, the cancer she has is 100% fatal for every person that's ever had in history. So then the mother, and so Charlene, rather just as a stepmom, and Jason, they're like, hey man, we need to get this out to other people. And so they came up with the concept of Warriors Mountain Foundation. I already had a nonprofit research center called Lincoln on Biomedical Research Institute, but they informed me that the name was too long and it sucks. So that's why they went to Warriors Mountain Foundation. I'm like, hey, I'm a scientist, I'm not a marketer, I don't know names. And so, uh, anyway, so that's how we, uh, we got there. Um, this is going to go up on our website, and uh, we've got some really cool stuff that's in the works right now. But the idea is, uh, you know, I talked with John Luke about somehow we could combine forces and help uh, children with neuroblastoma and stuff like that. Like, in my mind, I don't want anyone to die or to suffer from any disease, but we have to kind of draw a line in the sand and say we're starting here, and now we're going forward. And so uh, the reason why we started with Relax Oklahoma is just, um, it was the patient that was there in front of us at that moment, and kind of that's the starting point. So uh, anyway, with the technologies um, that we're doing now, imagine, if you will, these uh, patients that have these, these very serious cancers, they have to take 100 more pills a day just to stay alive. Uh, all kinds of drugs, all kinds of supplements, uh, all kinds of strange foods and stuff like that. And it's a really difficult challenge, and no matter how much money they have, it's, it's, uh, it eventually gets to the point where it's just overly expensive. And so what I've been working on is ways to deliver these, uh, these ingredients to them more efficiently so that they, we could dramatically reduce uh, you know, the expense. And so the goal is to have um, people come in three weeks, uh, basically get stable, and then they can go back home and live life like they would normally, and we can manage them from a distance. And right now, um, the unit might pay 3000 a month uh, for that in terms of when I go back home. My goal is to get that eventually under 500 bucks. 
and then eventually I want to be able to offer it for free. And so now imagine there would be no reason for anyone to go to these major cancer centers and basically could pay us money and die anyway. We'll actually be able to have people live from their own home and get better. And then it'll be extremely disruptive. Uh, just throw some numbers out there. Cancer generates $108 billion a year. The forces are so powerful that it's like a machine that's turning to make more money. And the profit incentives for business are totally diversified from the incentives to help people get better. So there's no incentive to heal or let's say cure cancer, if you will, even though cancer is totally treatable. There's no incentive because once it's done, there's no longer revenue coming in. So the business interest would be keep this person hanging on as long as possible because there's more money coming in. And uh, as sad as it is, that's, uh, that's the process that's going on with the machinery churning, if you will. So I hope that uh, video was uh, inspiring in some way. I didn't want it to be a downer and put a long uh, spin on anything. Well, the silver lining is you're, you know, I think our challenges throughout the day are like, how am I going to get this guy to squat or show up or lose weight? You're like, hmm, cancer. Let's knock that one off the face of the planet, right? So, I don't know. That's just an amazing task. I got a question over here. Sure. Yeah, I'm Josh Akiona. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tom. That's very awesome uh, what you're doing here. Uh, trying to treat cancer. That's awesome. Um, I had a question kind of dealing back to nutrients and uh, kind of nutrition and supplementation. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with uh, Dr. Richard A. Kuhn. I don't know how to pronounce it. He was back in the 80s and early 70s. Uh, he had this idea of macro nutrients or uh, macronutrition and kind of ortho carbohydrate type diet. This is like 20 years before everybody ever talked about like, paleo or anything like that. So I was wondering, is it true? Because he, he spoke a lot about this. It's, was it illegal to treat cancer via nutrition? Is that true? Oh, so, uh, okay, so if you are an oncologist, there is a standard of care that you are held to. And even when that standard of care doesn't work, and even when the oncologist doesn't believe it, there is a fear of uh, legal ramifications from that. So it, um, we hire, we have an oncologist on staff or on our team, and so the way we address that legally is nutritional related issues are handled by a non-oncologist, right? So a naturopathic physician or a nutritionist or something. So um, we don't then get into legal challenges. Uh, we also don't look at, um, it, it's difficult to say something like cure or treat because uh, like when, you, when someone has so much inflammation in the body and there's actually DNA damage, so their cells are proliferating without control, which the real enemy? You know, is it the DNA damage? Is it the cancer cell? Is it a microorganism that's generating the inflammation? Is it a low micronutrient? Let's say if someone has low selenium, the glutathione levels are much lower. They're at risk for damage from the environment, even breathing in uh, chemicals, pollutants from the air, um, or in countries where there's a higher intake of nitrated uh, pork products. It's like bacon. I know this will break a lot of hearts. It breaks my heart. Countries that have the highest intake of bacon have the highest incidence of brain cancer. So there's very clear relationships. So we try to help someone that has a disease like cancer. One of the challenges is like, well, who's the real enemy here? Right? It's not just the cancer cell. There's other factors that have to be addressed as well. Thank you. Uh, going back to what you're talking about, strengthening the CS. What would you recommend protocols to strengthen the CS? Oh, goodness. Uh, so I guess here's what I would say is, um, you know, like uh, years ago, the warm-up, so there's, um, there's a something called water effect. And so over time, like years ago, you'd have a warm-up where you maybe you would do like 10 or 20 minutes on a cardio machine, right? And then you do your strength training. And then over time, you had these functional movement screens or movement prep type things. Um, you know, those things are like general models, but for the individual, um, what you want to have is an awareness of where your own internal dysfunction is, and then you want to have movements that are pre-selected that help you overcome those internal um, dysfunctions, if you will. And so essentially what you would want to do is drills that help your brain map to the joint or the limb or the muscles where there's some, let's say, disconnect. And um, if you do that correctly, 
then we wind up translating is you could dramatically reduce your warm-up time to less than a minute, maybe maybe two minutes, let's say less, so that you're better prepared of going into the exercise, so whether it's sprints or strength training or endurance training, um, with less risk of injury, because you would not have a discrepancy between different sides of the body. Um, and then along with that, uh, when, I, when I evaluate people's training regimens, I don't see, they don't share with me their, their systems for monitoring their body's reaction to the stress of the movement. So let's just say, for example, you were going to do you know, five sets of back squats. You would have um, an assessment that you do on yourself. That assessment could be very simple, like touching the ground. So let's just say you could barely touch the ground with your fingertips, like a toe touch type test. You do a set of squats, and you go back, and if you cannot touch the ground, let's say you lose range of motion, that tells you that that movement is a threat to your nervous system, and so that there's some neurological shock. What most people would do is continue squatting and having a greater threat over time to the nervous system and lose their range of motion. What I would offer is that instead of going right back to squats, you would go to a positive input type movement pattern for the nervous system, and we'll show some of this in some of the practicals tomorrow. And the idea is re reestablish that, let's say, full range of motion where you can touch the ground again, then go back into the squat, so then retest yourself afterwards. And essentially, the, you know, the thought process is you no longer like do sets and reps for the sake of doing sets and reps. If you have an instantaneous evaluation, like right now, where's my nervous system at? What can I do? When we do this movement, could be a bench press, a squat, a deadlift, a clean, it doesn't matter, movement, it could be a sprint. And then let me retest myself. Did I lose ground? Did I reestablish what I lost before doing it again? And with that type of approach, initially it's going to make your workout longer, but as you understand your body better, you'll actually shorten the workout dramatically. But here, here's where it gets really cool. You may only need to do two sets of squats, so why would you do five to get the same benefits? So now think about how much faster your progress would be if after every workout you're always getting better. You never created like a grade that you dug deeper. You've only created a scenario where you're gonna get neurologically better, you'll have less um, over, uh, overuse, overtraining potential because you've kind of defined what to do. So I hope that um, answers your question. Yeah, that's all. So that sounds uh, really complicated. Yeah, that's a lot of stuff we've got to <clears throat> Thank you for answering that. Um, sounds really complicated. <clears throat> sounds like it requires a lot of self accountability. Uh, so it doesn't feel some new tropic, something like that. <laughs> <laughs> we do that like, awesome. <laughs> Well, I, I want results yesterday. I'm sure some of you do too. Uh, so there's certainly things that could be done to enhance um, the production of beta nerve growth factor in the nervous system and assist with the acquisition of. Uh, of uh, skill set, but um, it also has the potential, though, to help you acquire the wrong movement pattern faster as well, right? So while there is tools to accelerate things, we don't get to say, I want only the good pathways being done and not the bad pathways. It doesn't work that way. It's all the pathways. So whatever dysfunction you have, you would actually get that faster as well. So uh, I don't know if there's a tool that would work one way or Got one back here. As an uh, aspiring coach, I've recently dove into the world of getting my clients' blood panels done. Um, and to follow, we've been evaluating it quantitatively and qualitatively, how they're feeling, how the performance is, and the numbers. What are some basic markers you'll be looking for? And then <clears throat> more importantly from there, how frequently or how often are you getting them re-evaluated and rechecked? Is it on a quarterly basis or six months or is there any recommendations? Sure. So, um, uh, basic markers that I would uh, like to see in someone is vitamin and mineral levels um, from multiple cell lines. So, um, when, when typically when you go to a lab or a doctor's office and they do some measurements, they'll measure vitamin and mineral levels in serum or plasma, uh, sometimes whole blood. The limitation with those methods is they're kind of like an instant snapshot in time. And you know, a lot of that is subjective to what you had last night for dinner or your last supplement regimen. So it may not really represent what a coach wants to see. 
I think a better uh, set of data for a coach or a trainer or a therapist is maybe uh, longer term markers that can give you a better average over time because you don't really want to become a lab, right? You don't want to be testing every single moment because then that interferes with your coaching and other skill sets. So I would encourage people to look at things like red blood cell or erythrocyte mineral levels. Uh, sometimes it could be called um, essential nutrients or something like that from some of the different labs. And those represent a two to four month range of time. So you could collectively say a three month average. So with that type of model, you know, every three months or four months would be acceptable. Um, the thing that I would uh, caution is that, um, let's say we do a blood test now in the body and it has these results. Uh, you want to actually take action, right, and do something before you do the next test. Otherwise, what would you retest for, right? You don't want to just randomly do the testing. So there's, there should be some sort of therapeutic intervention. And typically, with a, a divided mineral panel, the therapeutic intervention would be improving the diet, providing foods that provide those nutrients, or some supplement regimen to complement the markers that were low, or maybe out of balance. Um, in addition to the erythrocyte uh, markers, the red blood cell minerals, I would do um, a lymphocyte or white blood cell panel. Um, Spectrocell lab is probably the best lab for that right now. And uh, that represents like a six to 12 month average. Basically, what determines the average for these markers is the life cycle, so it's the life of the cell. And so with something like that, um, you could do it quarterly, so if you want to standardize a system, you could say, you know, every three months I'm going to do this. But you start getting into a scenario of um, the return versus the investment, you know, the expense and so forth. Um, so maybe more practical would be something like um, once or twice a year, so you have a better balance between the investment people are making to their health, uh, you know, it fits their budget and stuff like that. Um, so those would be two things that I would say could really help people. Uh, but those are not instant gratification types of tests, right? It's like you learn something and you're going to go on this journey for several months to kind of correct it. It's not going to be like a wow. But I will say this, though, um, someone that's low in B vitamins or low in copper or zinc, uh, it's very common for them as soon as they start addressing those issues, they may feel a difference in days. And so because they were basically low in something that they need to make ATP or energy. Um, some other tests that could be done uh, certainly a CBC or CMP. Uh, the reason the idea behind a CBC is um, healthy people should be able to make cells. When there's something wrong in the system, the ability to make new red blood cells or white blood cells or platelets is compromised. And so you would see that those people be on the lower end of the spectrum. So it may not be, um, it won't tell you mechanistically what's going on inside someone, but globally or systemically it will be like, hey, there's something wrong. Uh, for athletes that, let's say, someone that's training a lot, maybe has some uh, aches and pains in their joints, markers like erythrocyte sedimentation rate, HSCRP, um, if there's an accessibility to measuring uh, interleukins, interleukin 1, interleukin 16, those are good markers as well. Just to kind of see is there inflammation over time. And the idea would be to address it, you know, uh, a wide diet that has a lot of color, like a wide variety of fruits and vegetables would be a good tool. Uh, if someone, um, for whatever reason, doesn't like tea, fruits and vegetables, maybe things like curcumin or green tea or resveratrol, some other supplements that have like a widespread <coughs> type of reaction. So that would be an idea. We got one uh, more back here. And then Leah, what? we might not have time, but fine, Dr. Tom, okay? I'll talk fast. Okay. Two things sort of related. I tried to get my blood work done. I was just with my primary care doctor for a physical, and he was like, why do you want your blood work done? You're healthy, what's the problem? I was like, well, I'm just like interested in knowing a little bit more about like what I'm seeing in my levels in my blood. Like he was really resistant to the idea. So sort of the question then is, when you're dealing with just regular people who are not necessarily interested in optimizing their performance in the way that John has been, or you know, trying to really be at the peak levels of performance and it may not even be you know whether it's a doctor saying you shouldn't get your blood work done because you're fine or they're just resistant to it themselves you know what are some just sort of practical things that you can tell clients or you know even in your own life whether that's about nutrition or i know tomorrow we'll be talking more about sort of physical things to do but 
it's not necessarily going to be possible, maybe, for everyone to get their blood work done and think about this on a monthly or yearly basis. So, what are some things that you recommend in that case? Okay, so um, some quick like cues to ensure health over the long term: adequate sleep. So make sure that uh, you can not only uh, breathe, so people sleep apnea, you know, and anyone with a neck circumference of about 16 and a half inches or more, chances are they have trouble breathing at night. So uh, anyone like me, I really struggle with turning my mind off at night and like battling myself in my sleep. No. <laughs> so so uh, you want to be able to basically you know, flick the switch off uh, so that you can get a restful sleep. Um, just to give you an idea, example, sleep is so important that even men that inject testosterone that have sleep issues, they can still have erectile dysfunction. So you always hear about how powerful testosterone is with belly muscle. What you don't hear is sleep can negate the effects of testosterone. So that's how powerful sleep is. So going back to testing, um, we, we've been doing a lot of stool testing, like the GI map, because one of the things that we seem to find is with like spike cells and some of the other stuff, you, if you've got issues in the digestive tract or whatever, you're going to take all the supplements of food that you want, it's not going to really make a huge difference. So are you, I mean, are you doing a whole lot of that? Do you put a lot of weight into looking at stuff like that? Like chronic you infections? You heavy metals. Like you always, uh, whenever we do the stool, it's always like a heavy metal deal. So, um, we do uh, a very, uh, let's say, robust stool analysis. Uh, we take samples and send Actually, them. Tom bolted. Yeah. <laughs> 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 He's big eye. That's his robust. He's researching the, the taste. <laughs> <laughs> the taste. <laughs> yeah. 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 I like yeah. this to put it through his hands. He could absorb that stuff through the nutrients. Yes, and, and this is why people say, why are you not more professional? <laughs> 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 uh, so, basically, uh, what we do is we collect specimens and we would homogenize them, so we would stir up the material, and uh, we would set it to multiple labs. We do a full microbiome analysis, so every the, the, the genetics of every uh, parasite, amoeba, and so forth. We also do um, microbiology testing as well. The reason is um, genetic testing of organisms is not sufficient for diagnosis because, keep in mind, you're not measuring the presence of the organism to measure the genetic fragments. So that means it was there, but let's say if someone has symptoms today, we need to know not only what was there in the past, but what's going on right now. So the reason why we do like the, kind of like the, the both of our methods, if you will, is because you have a more complete picture. And then you're, you're absolutely correct, um, if someone does have some um, dysfunction in their microbiome, it can definitely impact your ability either to it's the reaction to foods. So a lot of people say I have a food allergy. They really don't have a food allergy. It's the organisms in their gut reacting to the food, creating symptoms, and they assume it's a food allergy. Um, but so the way that we would interpret it is uh, you can do a panel through uh, Genova Diagnostics called the Nutri Eval, yeah. and, it, and it gives you uh, markers in the gut, and then that could be a lead in for more further work. The one that they bought from Metametrics? Yeah. 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 So, we've been using GI maps instead because you get the DNA fragments. But. And so that those are tools, right? And, and ideally, the more people you test, the more data you collect, you then start to see um, if there's certain patterns to maybe. So the, ideal, the ideal thing is how can I help someone as quickly and efficiently as possible in a, in a way that they can afford it and stick it out over time? Because unfortunately, um, all these different tests, the expenses do add up, and it becomes more problematic for people to stick it out over time. And plus, once someone's symptoms disappear, the value of the testing goes down, right? So there's no longer important, because they're not suffering anything. So, I guess anything to close out, Tom? Because we got maybe just a couple minutes. Uh, where can people find you? Uh, so, I'm a mystery man. That's true. So, uh, my well, website. I gave away his business card last night. It was actually in my pocket, so. <laughs> Uh, Cosenta.com is the uh, website. Uh, we've got a lot of really cool stuff uh, up there. Uh, so we, we did launch a podcast. Uh, we do a Facebook Live every week uh, where I can uh, hit up all kinds of uh, rapid fire questions and ask answer all kinds of things about health. And then we take those clips and then they use it all over the internet and stuff. Um, all that information is free, uh, it's no expense. We have uh, newsletters and stuff that people can sign up for. Uh, 
Uh, so the idea is we, we give out a lot of free content so people just get some ideas. And then if anyone wants to like, engage with uh, the professionals of the organization, um, this phone number you just call and that kind of stuff. All right. And uh, so I know uh, I talked to Dr. Mike, and then we're going to link up with Dr. Tom, too. Uh, I'm kind of an over-communicator. I don't know if you guys noticed with your inbox, uh, but we're going to get anything that these guys want to get in front of you that they've spoke about, we're, we're taking notes, we're gonna ship it off to you so that no stone is left unturned because that's how we fucking do things. Yeah. But uh, thank you, Dr. Tom, thanks, John. Big round of applause.